Whether you elected, get it because of the election. So join us in person. Or online. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us. We are thankful for each one of you. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you in prayer this morning, thanking you for this time together as a congregation. Thank you for this fellowship. Thank you for this opportunity to worship and praise you. We thank you that whether we're together in the sanctuary or we're online uh, worshiping and praying and praising you, that we're all connected in spirit. I ask that you would open our hearts for your message. Help us to grow together as a community and as a family. And we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. from James. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're thinking. 
I'm James, but I'm not from the scripture. Stephen will be reading this glorious scripture for us. Today's scripture comes from James 1, 2 through 8, and verse 12. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, it will be given, and it will be given to him. But must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed in by the wind. For the, that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Verse 12. Blessed is a man who preserves under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. See? 
morning, church. So ever since we were little, um, or your par- you parents might say this to your kids, uh, you always tell your kids before they cross the street to look both ways. Um, when I was younger, my uh, I lived uh, all our lots were about ooh, hot um, about five acres, and so there was a good distance I have to walk to actually go to my neighbor's house. Um, so my mom had a system where she would watch me cross the road over to the other side from her side, and then my friend's mom would watch me cross the road on, when I walked down the street. Um, that way, you know, when I was little, uh, you know, I'd be safe. Um, that was their arrangement, you know. So ever since we were little, we were drilled into our heads, look both ways before you cross the street. Well, a similar thing that I'd like to say is look both ways before you cross when you take communion. Um, you see, it's important for us to look both ways, both up to our Heavenly Father in reverence of the great and wonderful gift that he, he gave us, but also for us to look in to ourselves. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul said, <clears throat> Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. It's, it's very important for us to self-examine during this time, to make sure that there's no sin that we need to still confess. There's, Jesus talks about that there's no uh, you know, thing we are holding against our brother. So when we take communion, we need to also look both ways, both at God and also at ourselves. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, so much for sending your son to die for us. Thank you for that great sacrifice of love on the cross, uh, a pain that we could never even imagine, um, and a death that we were supposed to go through. Um, But your your son paid that for us, and we just thank you. Help us to be uh, worthy of communion this morning. Um, Help us to remember that great sacrifice you made, but also help us to look inside our, our hearts and make sure that we are honoring you uh, in that way as well. We love you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good to see everybody here today. I uh, want to uh, just uh, tell you, I am I'm excited about today. There's a lot I'm excited for. Uh, namely, uh, today uh, we uh, have the uh, reopening of Kids Faith. If you happen to hear some rumbles coming from the downstairs uh, during the service, uh, some sounds, you'll know that that is our uh, ki- kindergarten through fifth graders. Uh, and uh, we're excited to be able to uh, open things back up for them as we kind of gradually reopen. I know some of you probably are also have some preschoolers and things. You're like, hey, man, I'm ready for that to happen too. Uh, and we're, we're, we're going to be working through all that. But our mantra has been 
walk before we run in the midst of all of this as we try to get things reopened. Uh, and so we ask for your continued patience there. But we're excited to have our uh, kindergarten through fifth grade going again and them downstairs. And uh, Miss Rhonda's excited to see a lot of those kids. I know she's been missing uh, throughout these past few months. So we're, we're excited to see some of your families here too as well with the reopening of that. Also want to say thanks to Clay for last week uh, filling in for me. Had the opportunity to speak last Sunday at uh, Taste Creek Christian Church in celebration of their 75th anniversary. Uh, and so uh, that's, of course, my former uh, church that I served. And so I was honored to be able to come back and, and uh, speak with them. Uh, and so uh, we had a great time of visiting old friends and, and getting to reconnect with a lot of people. Uh, so I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to be able to, uh, to do that. Today, of course, is November the 8th. And uh, November the 8th, soon after, in a few days, is going to follow November the 11th. And November the 11th is the day that every year we honor our veterans uh, on Veterans Day. And so we want to take just a little bit of time. I want to take a little bit of time at the outset here of the, the message just to kind of recognize those of you who have uh, served, have served in our armed forces, even those of you who are presently serving in our armed forces. Uh, if you're watching online, first of all, welcome. We are always glad for all of those of you watching online. But if you are, are someone who's served and you're watching from home, please share with that with us in the uh, comment feed on the Facebook feed there. Uh, let us know what branch you served in so that we can honor you as well today. We want to make you a part of this. I'm just going to go ahead and, and go through the different branches of the military. And if, this, if you were a part of that branch, served or are currently serving, we'd ask you to stand if you're here in-house. And, and uh, so we can may, and, uh, identify you. Uh, the first one I'm going to mention here is one that's relatively new. And I don't know of anybody that's in the Space Force, but, but maybe there's somebody, especially on the Internet, out there online. You never know who's watching. Uh, but if you're a uh, member of the Space Force, we uh, would like you to stand at this time and be recognized. How about the Coast Guard? Coast Guard. The U.S. Army. The U.S. Army. If you are a veteran of the U.S. Army or presently serving in the U.S. Army, please stand. All right. <laughs> Stay standing for me. Stay standing. The Navy, the U.S. Navy. Hey, there's Richard in the back. He's waving. Yep. <laughs> Our Navy folks. The Marine Corps. The Marine Corps. All right. And the Air Force. The U.S. Air Force. There's Jim. Yep. All right. Let's have just another round of applause thanking them for their service to our country today. We so appreciate it. Folks, it's because of people signing up to do that that we get to do what we did last Tuesday. Uh, and so keep that in mind that the, one, the freedoms we have are not, they were bought with blood. Uh, and so we want to keep that uh, in mind today and honor those who have served and those who have given, of course, uh, the, uh, the highest level of service, which is the giving of their own lives in much the same way as our Savior did. So we want to honor you today. Thank you, all of you who have served in the branches of our military and continue to do so. Hello, my name is Nick Skinner, and I approve this message. <clears throat> Are you ready to stop hearing that right now? <laughs> That's one part I guess we're probably ready to, to stop hearing right now. The question a lot of us are asking at this time of year, is it safe, is it safe to have Thanksgiving? Have you had that conversation with your family? Is it safe to have Thanksgiving? That's the question so many are asking as we approach the holiday through this COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm sure it's a question many of you are having to wrestle with among your own families. And of course, wrestling with those varying opinions within your family as to what to do, right? Because everybody's got a different way they're navigating through this very odd time. And some people have, are taking different kinds of precautions than others. And so there's, you know, it's hard kind of getting all those things together. As Anne Marie Chaker writes in her column in the Wall Street Journal just a couple of weeks ago, she said the pandemic is creating some gut-wrenching decision-making for families. After seven months of isolation, the pull of getting, to to getting together is pretty strong, amen? But with cases surging across the country and hospitalizations rising too, the risks, she says, are high for traditional celebrations. And she cites a couple of things in her article, a couple of surveys. There was a survey done by a research group by the name of Civic Science, it works a lot with corporations and, and doing research for their marketing and different things. They surveyed 9,262 adults, and they said that only 27% of the people who responded to the survey are saying that they're going to celebrate Thanksgiving as they normally would. 
Of those, though, that they say are meeting in person but taking precautions, 20% of those plan to be with a smaller group, 14% plan to wear a mask, and 14% plan to social distance when they gather together. That was that survey of 9,000 or more people. Another survey of 1,079 people by the groups Axios and Ipsos found that at least two-thirds, those are both another marketing research firms, two-thirds of adults think traveling for the fall and winter holidays poses at least a moderate risk to their health and well-being, with 32% saying that it poses a large risk to their health and well-being. So people are trying to navigate this, right? And it's not always easy to navigate. Some people, I've seen people getting very creative, though, to find ways to get around the table with the people they love. As a matter of fact, one lady uh, bought, you know, those outdoor heaters. You see the big tower-like outdoor heaters. You see them at restaurants. I think even Rodney's over across the street here has some at the back patio, these, these big uh, uh, tower-like heaters. One lady was buying those so that she could do her family Thanksgiving outdoors. She spent about like a $500 to buy one of those outdoor heaters so they could socially distance outdoors and still have Thanksgiving. One man in Massachusetts who, we'll forgive him for a minute, at least I will, for being a Patriots fan. Uh, Wayne's not here to give, me, give him a hard time. Wayne, if you're watching on TV, I'm mocking the Patriots right now. Uh, <laughs> There's a man in Massachusetts, a big Patriots fan, tailgater and everything, and he's putting that knowledge to use, making his Thanksgiving with family and friends a Thanksgiving tailgate in his backyard. He's got to have a grill, a fire pit, a tabletop, lanterns, a deep fryer for the turkey, because what good is turkey unless it's deep fried, right? Uh, let's, we can fry anything. Deep fryer for the turkey, camping stoves for all the other sides and all the other parts of the meal. So people are finding ways to do it. People are finding ways to, to try to make it through this the best they can. Let me ask this question. Is there or anything keeping you from the Thanksgiving table this year? What's keeping you from the Thanksgiving table this year? Maybe it is COVID-19. Maybe concerns for health. Maybe it's <laughs> one that's been around for a while, and that's politics. Maybe it's politics kind of keeping you from the Thanksgiving table or just plain old geographical distance. What's keeping you from the Thanksgiving table? Is there something? The question is, will you come? Will you come? That's what we're wrestling with. The other night I was having a conversation with my dad. And he was telling me, he was recalling the story of someone that he knew, he'd known years ago growing up, uh, really gone though as he had, had matured, this, this man had gone and uh, really made a name for himself in the art world. And I mean, really made a name for himself. He was a a uh, guy that was into bronze sculpting. He, brought, he did the bronze sculptures of uh, furnishings for homes, decor for homes, and literally, when I say this guy made it big, uh, he's got three pieces on display in the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art, I mean, in the Met. I mean, this guy really made it big, but he's from rural, rural Indiana, same place kind of where I grew up, my parents grew up. Uh, my dad was recalling the story. This guy was, you know, a really kind of soft-spoken, a little bit awkward kind of guy, but a quiet person in many ways. And uh, he just became really well-known. Well, of course, like many times, you know, we do get together for reunions and different things. After uh, finishing school, he went off. Well, he went off, first of all, he went off to the East Coast. He kind of settled himself in the East Coast art scene and kind of began to, a new circle of friends and people in the art culture out there. And after living there for a handful of years, he came back to visit people, you know, for those reunions and different kinds of things that happened. He came back to visit people, friends and family, and he found it, found it so difficult to re-engage the culture of his Midwestern roots. Those in his new circle simply shared a different worldview than those that were in his old one in the Midwest, and he found it so hard to begin to find common ground again that those folks back home he could, they could relate to, uh, the things, common interests that they could discuss. And so he found he had to hard, work harder to make conversation with people. Even his manner of speech, which would have seemed normal in the world in which he lived every day, seemed odd and out of joint to those that he would visit on his trips home to Indiana. And eventually, he just plain told my father, he said, I just stopped coming back home to visit anyone other than family. I just can't come back here anymore because it was too hard. It was too much work, he felt, to be able to continue connecting in those relationships. What is it that keeps you from getting around the table with people in your life? What, what keeps you from coming back to sit with others around the table? Sometimes... It just seems like too much work, right? Relationships are work after all. Sometimes it just seems like to be able to make it happen demands more than we're willing or able 
to give. And maybe we even perceive ourselves as just unable to give what is being demanded, all the effort that's needed to put forth to make the relationship still work, to make the relationship happen. So we just don't come back around the, the table of sorts. In Psalm chapter 23, we read a familiar phrase in verse 5. Psalm 23, this is, of course, the great psalm about the, the shepherd, the good shepherd David wrote. In Psalm 23, verse 5, David wrote this. He said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, I'm not sure we spend enough time just sitting with this passage to process its meaning. I mean, we've heard this 23rd Psalm uh, many, many times before, right? And, and sometimes we read these familiar passages and we just don't sit with them long enough to really process what they mean. And I think when we, when we read through particularly verse 2 of that chapter, we get to that part about green pastures, right? And we think, of, oh, wow, God's abundant blessings. We think about he leads me uh, to those green, green pastures and, or makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside the quiet waters. We just say, oh, green pastures. Man, how, and what I do, I don't know about you, but all of a sudden, and it's a weird thing, when I hear that part of the, the verse, my mind immediately goes to Ireland, not the Middle East, right? My mind immediately goes to Ireland, and I think of these, these lush green fields, and I'm just laying in the cool grass, and oh, God, isn't he so good? And he's, it's so abundant, this, this wonderful feeling that I have in and, and this very fertile place. And the truth is, you know, and that's where we oftentimes in this passage we think of it indicating God's abundant provision. The truth is, in the Middle East, green pastures are a far different definition. Uh, in the Middle East, it's barren, largely barren. And, and these green pastures that David is talking about are green patches sprinkled amidst barren patches with just enough sprigs of grass to satisfy sheep for the day, and that's it. So it's more, that part about green pastures is really more about daily provision, provision for the moment. It's not really about abundance provision so much. The real part of this chapter that deals with abundant provision from God is really verse 5, the one we just read. It's the part of that chapter that really has more to do with the way in which he abundantly provides for us. And it's this picture of a table being prepared for us in the presence of our enemies. Now, when I, you and I think about inviting people over for Thanksgiving or participating in Thanksgiving at somebody else's house, our preference is always to enjoy it among friends, to enjoy it among family. We never willingly consider, at least as our first inclination, to invite enemies. <laughs> so why in the world does God give us this illustration in Psalm 23 as an encouragement today? Because that's the passage. This passage is intended as an encouragement. It's David praising God for his great provision. So how does it act as an encouragement? Because it shows the way in which he provides. It's the way in which he provides. The blessing and the challenge, you see, of coming to God's table is that there you will find a greater peace and provision than you've ever known, but it comes in the midst of your enemies. It comes in the midst of the difficult things in life, the overwhelmingly hard things in life. And it only takes place when we allow God to, let, to have all of the hardest parts of us when we allow him to see them and heal the hardest parts of us and do it in his way and not our way, that's the only way that we, per, we experience the abundant provision of God. And when we do experience it, we find exactly how abundant it really is. God's table is the place where our greatest fears are met with his great provision. And those two are in, those things are in, tied together. There, there's, no, there's no way to have one without letting God have the other. There's no way to experience his greatest provision without letting him come in and deal with your greatest fears and your greatest hardships. To experience the provision, to sit without endless insecurity at God's table, you've got to be willing to address the fear. And so often, that's what keeps us from coming to his table to begin with. If we're honest, we struggle to trust him to protect us in the places where we feel most vulnerable. We struggle to willingly move ourselves into places where we're totally dependent on God. And so today, as we consider what's keeping me from the table of God, maybe it's that. God, I, I'll do it your way a little bit, but I don't want to do it all your way. It's too hard. I, because if I do it your way, God, you're going you're gonna to want me to be totally dependent upon you. And, and I just don't know if I can do that. And so we never are able to sit at the table with God in complete 
security. We have such insecurity about it. I want you to turn with me today to Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. Turn with me to Matthew 18, verse 1. Here's what it says. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They are always asking this question. At least, at least we hear it repeated often in, in the Gospels. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They want to know. Just a few chapters before this, Jesus has already talked about Peter. And I think there's a little suspicion there. You know, maybe he's trying to elevate Peter. So where do we fit into this? And because this whole idea of a hierarchy. And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them. And he said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children... You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> whoever receives one such child, then my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be greater for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand caught or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the other ninety, over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. A lot of teaching there by Jesus, a lot of familiar teaching, things that, you know, we've heard, I mean, often in Sunday school stories, we've heard the, about the child being pulled over and, and, uh, and talking about the, the lost sheep and things. As we unpack this very familiar teaching of Jesus, it's important that we go back, we, that we take a look at what's happening as, as Matthew is recounting all of this teaching to, the, to his readers. And chapter 18 See, chapter 18 is what, part of what is known in the Gospel of Matthew as the community discourse. There are five major discourses in, Go in Matthew's Gospel, five major sections of just teaching by Jesus that Matthew shares. And this is actually the fourth of those five, and it's called the community discourse. And all of what Jesus is sharing here is happening in the context of just having done a lot of teaching to his disciples, preparing them for the cross. So he started to set the stage. He's been talking about how the Son of Man is going to pay a price, basically, uh, and, it, and he's going to be leaving them, and all of these things. He's setting the stage for that, uh, and, he, and he's basically now shifting the focus, saying, okay, the things I'm about to display at the cross, you're going to need to display them as a community. I, you will, and I expect you to display them as a community, that humility and that forgiveness and those types of things is what he's setting the stage where he's talking them about to them about reflecting the same attitudes that he's going to be displaying at the cross. So this is happening in the shadow of the cross, okay? This idea of a Savior who is willing to humble himself to the will of God for the sake of our forgiveness. So now we encounter this illustration of humility like a child. And what we learn from Jesus is that unless we have the humility of a child, we can't enter the kingdom of God or even be considered great in the kingdom of God. And the key here is that Jesus, when he talks about greatness in the kingdom, Jesus is not talking about a hierarchy. His disciples are talking about a hierarchy of greatness in the kingdom. Jesus is saying it's not about a hierarchy, it's about a testimony. I'm not, he's not concerned about you being great as far as being in, in, in some sort of hierarchical order of leadership and, and, and authority. He's like, I want you to have a great testimony. I want you to be great with your testimony of faith in God. So let's check out what Jesus is talking about. And the first thing here he says about this, he is really he points out to them that humbling yourself like a child means accepting utter dependence on God. Humbling yourself like a child means accepting utter dependence on God. This is critically under, important to understanding everything Jesus is laying out here. We have to ask, when he pulls this child aside and says, you know, whoever's humble like this child, how is a child humble? How is a child humble? 
We know from experience, either ourselves as a child growing up, or maybe as a parent or a guardian or someone who's worked with children, we know from experience, children rarely act with humility. They rarely act with humility. As a matter of fact, much of parenthood is actually helping a child react to life with humility instead of pride. It's coaching them on how to do it because their natural reaction is pride. Their natural reaction is, I can do this. I have enough ability. I have enough wisdom. And the parent with wisdom and experience comes in and says, no, wait a minute, you don't. I love you but, you, but you don't, and I need you to help you see this. They need people with experience to come around them, and, and, and they need to be able to be taught from that wisdom how to, be humil- have to have, how to have humility and be humble in their reaction to life. They're constantly having to be coached in that and accepting that reality. So Jesus' is, Jesus is point here isn't, he's not pointing to the attitude of a child as much as he's pointing to the reality of a child. The fact that they are almost entirely dependent on the adult world around them for protection and provision, whether they acknowledge it or not. And likewise, Jesus calls us to accept that same reality in our own lives, in our relationship with God, that we are utterly dependent on God. Whether we accept it or not, the fact is we are utterly dependent on God. Craig Blomberg states this in his commentary on Matthew. He says, without a recognition of one's fundamental inability to save oneself and without a subsequent complete reliance on God's mercy, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven. Bottom line. That's why later on in verses 8 and 9, which we read, Jesus tells us, he tells us to, to deal decisively and definitively with sin in the way that God would have us do that. Our willingness to deal with sin in the way that God has prescribed for us to do that is a real test. It's a real vivid evidence to us of whether or not we've accepted that reality that we're utterly dependent on God. For many, this is the very thing that keeps them from the table. It's not that God hasn't given them an invitation. It's that we're not willing to accept it. The pain of our sin hasn't yet outweighed the pain of change that's necessary in our life. And so we keep resisting God's path, trying a hundred different ways to do it on our own, ending ultimately with the same outcome every time until we finally are brought to that place to recognize we are powerless to do it any other way than God's. There's only one way to deal with life in a healthy way, and that's the way of God. So it's acknowledging humility of a child is acknowledging utter dependence on God. Number two, exploiting the spiritual dependence of others leads to certain judgment. Exploiting the spiritual dependence of other people leads to certain judgment. And there's a very important reason for this, okay? Sometimes the thing that keeps others from the table is us. Sometimes we are the thing that keeps other people from God's table. And we need to acknowledge our role in that. The church and every believer, every believer, all of us, need the humility to remain faithful to the mission. There is no room. Because of our mission, because of the reality in the world around us, there is no room for us to be flippant about truth. There's no reason for us to, especially no room for us to do that, especially right now in the era we're in, which is characterized by so much misinformation. Someone said a while back, I heard someone say that we live not in the age of information, but the age of disinformation. People don't know who to trust right now. People don't know. You could cite a million different things. Some of you probably even heard me cite those statistics earlier, and you're in doubt about the statistics about about what people are doing for Thanksgiving, because I don't really know the source. And how do I know if they don't have an angle, if they have a bias, if they... We all are asking that same, we are skeptical right now of everything we hear because we don't know what to trust. And in an era of disinformation, you know, here we are as the church with a message that has eternal consequences. So our concern, our our concern for being consistent, being well-researched, substantiated, and honest, even when it's hard, matters. There are already enough barriers today put up by sin and by the world when it comes to people accepting the invitation to God's table. There are already enough barriers by just living and existing where we do today. And when when we share an unfounded rumor, we share an unverified story, a poorly researched article, withhold facts, flat out lie, we diminish the reliability of our voice. What does that do to the message? There's a lot of other stuff Eternity rises above it all. And that's the message we have, and that message is important. And we've got to make sure that the voice of the church 
is one people can rely on, our voice, even as a person, one that people can rely on for truth. In our passage today, Jesus states that anyone who causes one of these little ones to believe in him to sin would be better off having a millstone hung around his neck and drowned. Now, the little ones that, people, that Jesus is talking about in this passage are people who are already following him or inclined to follow him, but they're led astray by the actions of other believers. Jesus' teaching is not to the world here. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He said, don't be the ones that lead them astray. He's talking to other believers. The phrase to sin here, when it says causes to sin, it really means to cause to apostatize, not, not, not to cause offense, okay? Because, but frankly, you and me, we are never going to walk through this life without causing people offense every now and then. Jesus walked through this life perfectly and still caused offense. He was the stone, the rock that caused offense, uh, even with his perfection. And so, uh, you know, this is not a, like a, a one-time offense. What we're talking here is about a lifestyle that leads others who would otherwise accept God's table invitation to reject it. That's what we're talking about. That's what Jesus is talking about. And so serious is Jesus about judgment against such a person that he describes it in this way. They would uh, would prefer to have a large millstone tied around their neck than face the judgment of God and be be thrown into the sea with that millstone than to face the judgment of God. That large millstone was a huge wheel that was used to crush grain so that they could make it into flour. And it was so large, those millstones, that a donkey had to be used to make the apparatus rotate to crush the grain. It was so large. And imagine such a stone tied around your neck and then Jesus also uses a term for the depth of the sea when he de- describes that, that judgment. That, that term he uses there literally means the deepest part of the sea. As Blomberg states in his commentary, he says, Jesus leaves no room for doubt over the certainty of the drowning. And that's intentional. He, that is very intentional. So it's, it's a sobering reality, this trust that we've been given to be a people of truth that the world will hear So are we a people of truth? If people wanted to look for someone willing to give them straight truth, would they think of you or would they think of me? As someone willing to give them straight truth. Have enough humility to honor truth no matter the consequences to yourself. The world needs reliable lighthouses to illuminate the way to God's table. Thirdly, some people hide from God and he will not force them to return. There's another interesting fact in this passage. As Jesus is driving home this teaching about humility, he makes an observation about the humility of God. And it's a powerful story, one that stood the test of time we've, we've gone to for encouragement time and time again. This idea that God would leave the 99 sheep on the hills to go and find the one that went astray. Leaving the 99 was not negligence on on the shepherd's part in the illustration or on God's part in in the reality that Jesus is trying to communicate. That's that's not negligence. As a matter of fact, we talked about it a number of months ago. Uh, He knows he can lead the 99. The shepherd knew he could leave a 99 sheep on the hillside because usually shepherds went out and grazed their sheep together with other shepherds. So he knew those 99 had a support system. They were taken care of. He had no worries for them. They were where they needed to be. They were going to be taken care of. The one he's concerned about is the one who doesn't have the support system, the one who's left vulnerable, who's put themselves even in a vulnerable position by virtue of decisions they've made and where they have gone and where they are. So he goes and he even risks his own well-being to go out and to find this lamb who's in an extremely vulnerable position without protection from predators. You know, elsewhere in scripture it says the shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. But if you're away from the shepherd, you're a sitting duck. So the shepherd exposes himself to potential danger to find this lost sheep. We're familiar with all of that. But notice verse 13. Verse 13, the language that that Matthew uses and Jesus uses, and if he finds it. And if he finds it. That if says a whole lot. Now, obviously, no one is ever truly lost to God Okay, in the sense of who God is, he's aware of us, he's aware of our physical place, he's aware of our spiritual reality at all times. He knows those things even when we aren't aware of them. He's aware of them. But the point in the context of what Jesus is sharing here in this illustration is to highlight that people attempt to hide from God. People attempt to hide from God. And even if he finds them, he will not mandate that they return with him. 
If their will is to continue to hide, he will not force them to return, though his love and his concern for them never dies. He will not force them to come with him. It is, a, it is a, a decision of choice. It is a decision of the free will we've been given by God. So the point is this. The choice to sit at God's table is ours. The choice to sit at God's table is ours. All roads in the end end at us, end at me, end at, end at you. It's our, de- our decision, our choice Yeah, maybe it causes you to confront some very intimidating issues in your life. Yes, maybe you haven't always even had the best living examples of of God in your life lighting the way to the table. Maybe you've been in those scenarios we talked about. But in the end, for some of us, I just kind of wonder if, yeah, even if those things are true, maybe we're kind of also using them to hide behind a little bit today. Maybe we're trying to hide behind them like a bush in in the brush in the wilderness What if all of those explanations really come down to one basic fact, that you are hiding from God, or that I'm hiding from God? Only one person can choose to stop the hiding. Only one. And that's us. That's us. So here's the invitation today. Come sit at God's table. Change that story. Change that narrative. Come sit at God's table by accepting utter dependence on him. Accepting that you cannot do it without him. And you can't do it without his way and his path, and that's the best way. As Dave Ramsey is famous for saying, the invitation he puts forward is this, live like no one else now, so that later you can live like no one else. That's the invitation God's putting to us as well in a spiritual sense. That we live in a way that is not like the world, but of God's way. That we submit ourselves to that so that we can inherit something better, not only in this life, but in the life to come. Humble yourself to begin living in freedom and promise like never before. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for the great teaching of Jesus and this invitation that we just come to this table, Lord. It's intimidating sometimes, and it's, it's odd to think about that, that the table that you've offered before us can be intimidating because, yes, Lord, you, you, you make a table before us in the presence of our enemies. The, the, the table that you set for us is also the place where we confront our hardest things, the most difficult things in our life. But, Lord, there's this only path to find the freedom that you offer, which is so abundant, that is so great. There's no longer a need to sit in insecurity in this life when we find ourselves finally at the table. So, Lord, may we come to the table today. Lead us to your table. Help us to take that step today. If we don't know, if we've never even taken the first step of making Jesus our Savior, may we make that decision today. Whatever decision you lay on us, Lord, today, may we honor you with it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, if you have a decision to make and you're in this place, we invite you just to stay in the seat that you're in. Following the service, we'll have someone, one of our leadership or staff, come to talk with you. If you're online watching us today, we encourage you. And you want to make a decision, contact us, office at nschristianchurch.org or through the, just private messaging us through our Facebook page. We'd love to come alongside you as well and help you begin that walk to the table. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and stand, our, stand and sing our song of decision today. Let's stand together. i
this, we owe all to Jesus. We owe all to Jesus. Just a few announcements I want to share with you today. First, just a reminder, as far as offering and things, we remind you that if you're here and you'd like to be able to participate in that grace of giving, there's offering boxes at the rear of the sanctuary on your way out. There's also opportunity to set up online donations or online giving through the church website, nschristianchurch.org, or you can just send them to our P.O. Box, P.O. Box 1344, Georgetown, Kentucky, 40324. Uh, honestly, and share, I had some great news to share with you. If you didn't see it in Nick's notes this week, uh, some great progress uh, on our capital campaign. We, we're not even to the halfway point of our capital campaign, our three-year campaign, but we are now, because of some great generosity, we are over halfway to our goal as of today. Uh, we uh, had some very great uh, donations come in over the past week, and we're over somewhere. I think it's, Wayne, remind dollars $257,000 uh, toward our goal already on the capital campaign. So thank you, and praise the Lord for just the way he's moving. Uh, our congregation has been very blessed, honestly. i got to tell you, we praise to God. We have been very blessed through this time. And uh, we need to please, please join us in thanking God for that. Please, please, please. Uh, that is all God, and, and God's moving greatly. And the building project, construction, if you haven't driven out by there, please do. There are pictures in Nick's notes and things that we try to keep people updated. And others I know of you go out and get pictures too. So that's something that's very, very encouraging. God is good, and he is really, really blessing us. Uh, the other thing, uh, a couple things I want to mention to you. Uh, first, I know uh, this year, uh, we uh, normally, actually our plan this year was to join in the community Thanksgiving meal that the, the Ministerial Association usually puts together, but in light of COVID-19, that event is not happening. Instead, the Ministerial Association here in uh, Scott County is uh, honestly partnering with the family resource areas in each of our schools and partnering with schools to help provide these Thanksgiving baskets in the school system. We've been partnered particularly with Scott County High School, and I hope to have more information to share with you through Nick's notes and perhaps even next Sunday on how we can donate together uh, to uh, help be a blessing to those families in need within our school system. So we'll give you more information about those Thanksgiving baskets and partnering with the school system on that. Uh, so keep an eye on Nick's notes for that. Uh, the third thing I wanted to mention is some of you also may have seen this in Nick's notes as well. Doug Evans was in the hospital here recently with COVID-19. And, uh, and things, and I saw just a few minutes ago an email that I got from Laura uh, stating that he is now home. So praise the Lord for that. He is at home recovering from that. Uh, so continue to lift them up in prayer and everyone who is struggling. We're going to see, and I think we're starting to see even more of that in people we know in this community with varying degrees of symptoms and so forth. So please continue to keep our community in prayer uh, with that. I think that's everything I got, though, now. So <laughs> Wayne, would you close us with a word of prayer? And then uh, we'll be dismissed. Father, we are just in awe that you call us your children and you have accepted us and adopted us into your family through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Father, that's an awesome thought. And we thank you for Jesus' words to us in Matthew 18. Pray that we can take to heart what uh, Nick has spoken today. Father, we just, we love you. We thank you for these opportunities that we do have, even in these times as they are, to gather together to worship you, whether here or online. We thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You would please be seated and you will be dismissed by pews.